I'm about to see if um just to make sure the test not locked for me because okay. you know, the problem that had happened last time. Right. Okay. Um, it should be available, but double check. What happened? They shared the wrong thing. Okay, we may not get through all of this. This is a, a pretty long lecture. Um, I'll probably save some of it for next week, which uh, the DNA technology is a shorter lecture. Change the view on that. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about in this first section genetics and genes. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt, but in McGraw, it still says the exam is due at 12 a.m. tonight. Um. Today's the uh, eighth, right? Yes. I but thought on I the exam. It should say the ninth. On well, McGraw Hill, it says that it's due March 9th at 12 a.m., which means after 11.50 p.m. Let tonight, me, it won't be available. Let me check that. We'll just stop for a minute. Where's the canvas? Okay. It should say March the 9th at uh, 12 a.m. Is that right? If it is wrong, I'll just have to reopen it in the morning. Let me see, exam two. Okay, I can't seem to, since it's already open, I can't seem to uh, do anything. What I'll do is uh, first thing in the morning, I'll double check it. And if I have to, I could just reset it in the morning. Because I'm assuming nobody's going to be taking it <clears throat> after midnight tonight. And I doubt anyone would be taking it early in the morning. So I'll just reset it then. But right now, since it's already in progress, I can't change anything. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. No. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> there's uh, a lot of terms to define what a genome versus a gene, genotype versus phenotype. Talk about the structure of DNA and its important components talk about bacterial DNA replication and the enzymes for that process. 
And what's the difference between the leading and lagging strands of DNA replication? So genetics is study of inheritance or heredity. It uh, explores the transmission of biological traits from parents to offspring, how those traits are expressed, the structure and function of genetic material and how this material changes. Now, bacteria do not pass genetic traits from parent to child. They just pass it on to the, the cell that they, each time they replicate, they can pass it on horizontally. Whereas when you have offspring, that's vertical transmission. So you have the organism level, then the cellular level, the chromosomes and eukaryotes, we have paired chromosomes. Bacteria have a single circular chromosome. The molecular level, excuse me, level is the actual structure of the DNA molecule. The genome is all the genetic material of an organism. Most of it exists in the form of chromosomes. Now, if you remember, bacteria have plasmids that have uh, tiny pieces of DNA. And uh, also plants have chloroplast that has its own genetic material and the mitochondria, including the mitochondria and us actually have their own genetic material. So gen genomics is gonna be the study of all the organism's entire genome, all the DNA. So a composite here, a eukaryotic cell has chromosomes in the nucleus. We have a little bit of genetic uh, material in our mitochondria. Photosynthetic organisms, plants and algae, they have chloroplast that has its own genetic material. Bacteria, and some fungi and protozoan have plasmids, which are extra chromosomal genetic material, not necessary for their survival. But particularly in bacteria, these plasmids can carry antibiotic resistance genes and other virulence factors. The bacteria, as I said before, is single circular chromosome. They also have these plasmids, which they can exchange with other bacteria. Viruses have a small bit of genetic material enclosed in a protein capsid. Some of them have a membrane that they take from the host. They, they modify that membrane by putting their own proteins in it. The chromosomes, a discrete cellular structure of neatly packaged DNA. Eukaryotic chromosomes are in the nucleus. They vary in number from a few to hundreds. They can occur in pairs or singles, and they have a linear appearance. Bacterial chromosomes are just usually a single circular, but still double-stranded DNA, although many bacteria have multiple circular chromosomes and some have linear. but that's a little unusual. Genes is the basic informational packets. So our genetic code is in the genes and classical genetics is the functional unit of heredity. Molecular and biochemical genetics, so the site on the chromosome that provides the information for a certain cell function. The preferred a definition of Sagan of DNA that contains the necessary code to make a protein or an RNA. So the DNA also has this, uh, the genes to make RNA molecules. So the genotype of any organism, that's all the genes they have, whether they're expressed or not. The phenotype is what genes of the genotype that are actually expressed and created certain structures and or functions. There's a variation in genome size. E. coli, a single chromosome has 4,000 genes. 
is one millimeter long if unwound and stretched out. It's a thousand times longer than the cell. Our human cell has 23,000 genes on 46 chromosomes. It's just an electron <clears throat> micrograph of a, uh, of a uh, chromosome, actually the DNA, oops. The structure of DNA, it's made up of three molecules, a phosphate, a deoxyribose sugar, and a nitrogenous base. And that's everything in the DNA molecule, not including some proteins to give it stability and eukaryotes generally. The prokaryotes do not have these additional proteins called histones. So the molecule has the sugar. It's a five carbon sugar. Each carbon is numbered going one, two, three, four, five. Up here, five is where the phosphate connects. And the phosphate below it connects at three prime position. And so the molecule grows in this direction. As, as phosphates are added. The nitrogenous bases uh, connect with the other strand. It's a double-stranded molecule. There's four nitrogenous bases. You should uh, remember that G always binds to C and T always binds to A. You don't have to remember that G and A are double ring and C and T are double or single ring, but a double ring always has to bind to a single ring molecule. You don't have to memorize that, but you should know G binds to C, T to A. These bases are referred to as purines and pyrimidines. A always pairs with T and G always pairs with C. This is more detailed look at it. So you have this double-stranded molecule. So this right side is one strand, three parts, phosphate, sugar, deoxyribose, sugar, and a nitrogenous base. So these can form hydrogen bonds, the G and C, it's three bonds, A and T, two bonds. So the spacing is always even in the DNA molecule. The molecule is a double helix. It has this spiral staircase structure. You could think of the steps that go across the nitrogenous bases. Now, the orientation of the molecule is always determined by the position of the sugars. So the, uh, the number five carbon in the sugar and the three prime there, so this molecule grows from the five to the three prime direction, but on the other side, it's the different orientation. It's five to three, so we call this anti-parallel. One strand goes in one direction, the other strand goes in the opposite direction. An anti-parallel uh, arrangement, one side of the helix runs in the opposite. So five to three prime in one direction and three to five prime in the other. This is a significant factor in DNA synthesis and protein production. Now the single circular chromosome of a bacteria, they have the enzyme that makes a new strand of DNA, the DNA polymerase. And in one side, the new strand can grow in a leading, uh, what's called the leading strand, a continuous 
direction, but the other one, the other side opens up gradually. So you have these lagging strand. These pieces have to be joined together when the DNA finishes replicating. So these are called the lagging strands. The strand that grows continuously is the leading strand. The enzymes involved, there's an enzyme that unzips the helix called helicase. You have a primase that makes a small RNA primer. You have two DNA polymerases. One adds bases to the new chain. It also proofreads for mistakes. The other polymerase removes the RNA primer, closes gaps, and repairs mis mismatches. There's an enzyme that joins together the lagging strand fragments called a ligase. There's an enzyme topper isomerase that uncoils the DNA. There's actually two of those. One's referred to as a DNA gyrase, which one of the antibiotics that uh, stops uh, replication in bacteria inhibits this enzyme DNA gyrase. Replication is semi-conservative. By that, there's always one parental strand, the old strand, and one new strand. So the, each of the bacteria that uh, comes from a replication has half of the genetic information is the old, and the other half is new. The DNA polymerase synthesizes a new daughter strand and uses the parental strand as a template to make a complementary strand. The uh, term complementary refers to just the fact that A always binds to T and G always binds to C. The molecules being that double helix that uh, has to be unwound and separated to make a new chain. Nucleotides can only be added in the five to three prime direction. Where the molecule opens up to start replication is called a replication fork. Each circular DNA in bacteria has two replication forks. There's some RNA that's used as a primer to start the process and is then removed. The leading strand is always synthesized continuously in a five to three prime direction. The lagging strand <clears throat> has to wait till the molecule opens up each time because it is also synthesized in a five to three prime, but it creates these fragments discovered by a Japanese researcher called Okasaki fragments. Those have to be joined together. So this shows you an actively replicating DNA molecule. Oops, sorry. The one molecule breaks the bonds, the top or isomerase unwinds the molecule. And since when the molecule opens, since this is in the five to three prime, this chain here can grow continuously. Whereas here, it has to open up as it goes along and you get these fragments that are then joined together. So this is the leading strand and this is the lagging strand. Elongation and termination of the daughter molecule. So this is again referring to a bacterial. So we just see a single circular chromosome it can have two replication forks. So you have an old and a new set of genetic material. It separates, so the red and blue, the red would probably represent the parental, the original strand, and the blue, the new strand. And this would be into two different cells. 
Replication of eukaryotic DNA is similar to replication of bacteria in the archaeal back, uh, DNA. It uses a variety of DNA polymerase. Replication proceeds in both directions, but from multiple origins. The topper isomerase unwinds the molecule and then rewinds it after it's been replicated. A gene is a fundamental unit of heredity. It's located on a specific site on the chromosome. It's a segment of DNA that codes for a protein. So we didn't actually define all that, but, but all these are true. Genes, a fundamental unit of heredity, has a specific site and it codes for a protein. So here, which, which of these matches? A matches, binds to which molecule? T. C. T and T binds to what? To A. What does G bind to? C. C and C to G. Semi-conservative replication means one of the original strands is preserved and a new strand is made. Gonna go. Sorry, I don't know what the dog wants. Applications of the DNA code, transcription, and translation. So the first part of DNA, I mean of protein synthesis, consists of transcribing the genetic code and then translating it. So we're gonna talk about what's considered the central dogma in molecular genetics, that is genetic information goes from DNA to RNA to a protein though this has been a uh, bit modified by recent science. We'll talk about the structural and functional differences between RNA and DNA. We'll talk about the steps of transcription, noting the key elements and the direction of message RNA synthesis. There are three types of RNA that are gonna be involved in translation. So the information for an RNA is on DNA. So when you make RNA, it's called transcription. When you duplicate DNA, it's called replication. The genetic code is on the DNA. On the RNA, on the message RNA, we have what's called the codon that is complementary to the genetic code. And on the transfer RNA, is an anti-codon to identify which amino acid. There's a promoter region, which is the start region for transcription. There's a start codon that's the beginning. And on the ribosomes, there are A and P sites that are involved in translation. So translation is the part where the codons on the RNA give rise to the actual protein. We'll talk a little bit about the difference between eukaryotic transcription and translation versus bacteria. We'll also talk a little bit about genomics and protonomics. The central dogma of genetics is transcription. DNA is used to make RNA. RNA is used to make proteins. However, this central dogma is incomplete. There are a wide variety of RNAs we know now, more than the basic ones involved in protein synthesis. Many genetic malfunctions that cause human disease are found in these small RNAs called regulatory RNAs and not on the genes. The DNA that codes for these uh, RNA molecules was once called junk DNA because people didn't think it did anything. 
but it turns out it plays an important role in regulating genes. So in microbes, that it's single circular chromosome, there's three kinds of RNAs. There's the transfer RNA that has this structure. The transfer RNA carries the amino acids that'll make up the protein. The message RNA has the codons that are complementary to the genetic code on the DNA. Then there's the ribosomal RNA. The ribosomal RNAs bind with ribosomal proteins to make up the ribosome. There's these additional regulatory RNAs, but these are not involved in uh, the, the uh, protein synthesis, but they can regulate things. There's microRNAs, interfering RNAs, antisense RNAs, and um, they can regulate it, but they don't carry the genetic code. They can be involved in uh, turning it on and off. So you need these three RNAs, the transfer, the message, and the ribosomal to get to a protein. The message RNA binds to the ribosome and then they have to have a matching sequence on each of the transfer RNAs that bring a specific amino acid in, in a specific order to make the protein. The protein's primary structure determines its characteristic shape and function. Proteins ultimately determine the phenotype. That's what the organism looks like to the outside world, what you can actually see. The genotype, if you remember, is all the genes. If you remember, maybe from if you had a basic biology class, they talked about dominant and recessive traits. You can carry a trait that's not ex, uh, expressed, that's called, it's still part of your genotype, but it's not part of your phenotype. So genomics is the study of the genes, protonomics are all the proteins that are actually expressed. DNA is mainly a blueprint that tells the cell what kind of proteins to make and how to make them. So the parts of this uh, to get to protein synthesis, transcription first of the RNAs. We have the message RNA that has the codon. Transfer RNA has the anti-codon. And it carries an amino acid that uh, is determined by that codon. There are the regulatory RNAs. The ribosomes are made up of ribosomal proteins and ribosomal RNA. There are another series of enzymes involved in protein synthesis. The raw material are the amino acids that make up the proteins. So the message RNA, it has the sequence for the order of the amino acids. It transports the DNA master code to the ribosome and it is translated. Transfer RNA brings amino acids to the uh, ribosome during translation. It is not translated, only the message RNA is. The ribosomal RNA is a large structure made up of ribosomal RNA and proteins. It's a major part of the ribosome that participates in protein synthesis. You have these microRNAs, regulatory, they can regulate gene expression. They're not translated. You have primer RNA can help start DNA replication. It is also not 
translated. By translated, I mean uh, what ultimately becomes a, uh, a protein. There's riboenzymes and spliceosomes. There's something unique to uh, eukaryotic DNA. It has these sequences called introns that are not translated, but have to be removed. So you have this cloverleaf structure to the transfer RNA. And on the one part of it, it'll have three. So that each codon is made up of three bases on the uh, genetic code and each one specifies an amino acid. So, on the message RNA, there's going to be this codon, and this has to be complementary to it. Now, what happens in RNA? There's no T. The T is replaced by uracil. So U is complementary to A, A to U, C to G doesn't change in RNA. Single-stranded molecules that uh, exist in a helical form. The uh, different I'm referring to differences in RNA structures. If you noticed, there's some a little bit of complementary binding, so we do have some double-stranded, but it's one molecule, but regions of it uh, bind. So it has secondary and tertiary levels of complexity. So I said before, uracil replaces thymine in RNA. Also, the sugar is ribose sugar, whereas in DNA, it's deoxyribose sugar. The message RNA is a transcript of structural gene or genes in the DNA. Synthesis in a process similar to that of the leading and strand during DNA replication. The codon is any three triplet bases that hold the message for the transcribed message RNA. The transfer RNA has those as the anticodon. Uh, to, that is complementary to the uh, codon, which is on the message. Determine which amino acid. So ribosomal RNA is a long polynucleotide molecule. It has complex three-dimensional shapes contributing to the structure and function of ribosomes. The interaction of ribosomal RNA and protein creates the two subunits of the ribosome. So this is the ribosome has the two subunits. It has a P and an A site. So these little blue shapes represent an amino acid. So first, this has to come together, the two parts of the ribosome, the message RNA has to bind it has a start codon, and there's a, uh, a transfer RNA with a amino acid. It has to start at the start codon, and then the next transfer RNA comes in. Transcription initiation, when the RNA polymerase, remember in DNA replication, it's a DNA polymerase and RNA, it's an RNA polymerase. There's a start site that's not translated, referred to as the promoter region. So the RNA polymerase knows where to start. It binds to the promoter region and then transcribes the RNA. And it keeps going till it reaches what we call stop codon. 
the termination of that, the stop codons are not translated. They do not code for an amino acid. The general principle of translation, message RNAs are read in codons or groups of three. The codon dictates which amino acids are added. Except for a very few cases, this code is universal for bacteria, the RKE, the eukaryotes, and viruses. So this is a chart showing you the entire genetic code. You see that <clears throat> there's three uh, bases equals a codon, and each codon is unique for an amino acid. Now you'll see some redundancy. These two codons are both for phenylalanine. Here for leucine, which is a more common amino acid, it has six. If you notice that the first two bases are exactly the same, here they are, here they're, uh, sorry, here U, U, here it's C, U. And the difference is the last base. So this protects for mutation. If you have a mutation in this place, you could still get a functional, uh, get the right amino acid, still have the same functional protein. The start codon is always the same, it's AUG. And you'll notice there's several stop codons, two here and one over here. These stop codons do not code, get tr translated, in other words, to an amino acid. They simply tell the, uh, the protein synthesis process to stop. The way you read this, you start on the left-hand side, U, C, A, G. So if your codon starts with the U, you'll notice going across here, all these codons start with U. That's the first position here on the left. The second position is in the middle, it's read from the top. So for example, if you had UC, you would go over here, third position, or the last one is read from this side of the chart. So if you had, for example, CAA, well, you know C is here, you go across till you find a CA, and then over here, A, CAA codes for glutamine. And that's all it is to the genetic code. Some amino acids are represented by multiple codons. This, as I said before, this redundancy allows for insertion of, of correct amino acids even when a mistake occurs in the DNA sequence. Only the first two nucleotides are required to encode the correct amino acids. The third one does not change the sense uh, of the uh, which amino acid. So this permits some variation or mutation without altering the message. So for DNA, you have the coding strand, not both strands are, are not uh, translated, just one strand. And that the genetic code goes from the, the DNA to the message RNA, which are the codons you see right here. This message starts with AUG, that's the start codon. Then there's a transfer <clears throat> RNA that would be complementary. So UAC is complementary to AUG, and that would code for the first amino acid.
translation is then the second stage. You have the transcription for the three different RNAs. You need all of these, the message transfer, you need amino acids, you need the ribosomes. Translation has three steps, the initiation, the elongation, and then eventual termination of the process when it gets to a stop code on. So this shows you the start codon. The first amino acid is brought in. The second amino acid is brought in. Peptide bond is formed between these. So this is the initial start, the initiation. The elongation happens once the bond is formed between the amino acids. Translocation occurs when this first one that now doesn't have the amino acid gets kicked out. Let me move that. Gets kicked out and this one will then translocate to the first site, the P site, and another transfer RNA will come in and it will keep going until we get to a stop codon. When that happens, the process stops and the protein is completed. So this just shows you the continuation of that. It keeps going till you finally get down to a stop codon. The protein chain is always growing here and new amino acids keep uh, getting brought in as long as there are codons. The start codon is always AUG. The first three nucleotides, they start this, the beginning of the message. The stop codon or nonsense codons because they do not code for an amino acid. They cause the translation to be terminated. Translocation is that process of shifting the ribosome down the message RNA strand to read new codons. There's also, once the protein is synthesized, they can have post-translational modifications. The proteins themselves, once they're synthesized, they fold upon themselves to get their tertiary conformation. The, uh, the, the first amino acid is a formal methionine, which has to be removed. Cofactors can be added and some join with other proteins to form a quaternary structure. If you remember that, we talked about <clears throat> enzymes. In bacteria, they can speed up this whole process by having multiple ribosomes bind to one message. And so they can be continuously making Lots of proteins, uh, bacteria replicate very quickly and they have, have to carry out their metabolic uh, processes very rapidly. The difference between pro-neukaryotic transcription and translation, co-translation only occurs in bacteria and archaea, that's what's happening here that you have multiple ribosomes making uh, uh, copies of the protein. AUG codes for a different form of methionine in eukaryotes. And eukaryote messages only code for one protein. Bacterial message RNAs might have the codons for several different genes. Most karyotic genes do, uh, do not exist in an uninterrupted series of codons. They have what are called introns. The introns are not translated. So what happens is when you make a message RNA, these introns have to be removed by uh, processing. There's these special enzymes 
that bind and form these sites called a spliceosome that removes the introns. Finally, the introns are removed and what's called the exons that have the actual coding sequence are joined together and you get a mature message RNA that can go into the cytoplasm to carry out protein synthesis. So the exons have the coding region, the introns do not. So the enzyme called a spliceosome recognizes that the site between where the exon and intron is and removes the introns. Viruses, their genetic material is either DNA or RNA, but never both. Sometimes they have, they have a protein coat, but sometimes they have a membrane they take from the host. They have, uh, viruses can affect the genetic uh, material of cells, change the cells they infect. Viruses are very compact and economical in what they need. The diversity of viral genetics, their genes are sometimes linear, sometimes circular. Uh, some are one molecule, some are in segments. They can have double-stranded DNA, single-stranded RNA, single-stranded DNA, double-stranded RNA. So we're going to <clears throat> review here the, the function of each. So what's the function of the message RNA? What's found on the message RNA? Okay, the message RNA has the codons. Which RNA has the anti-codon? Transfer RNA has the anticodon, and the ribosomal RNA binds to ribosomal proteins to make the ribosome, which is the site of protein synthesis. The blank enzyme directs transcription, that would be the RNA polymerase. True or false, more than one codon can exist for an amino acid. Is that true or false? Anyone? That is true. true. Uh, bacterial and eukaryotic, the differences between bacterial and eukaryotic transcription and translation. So in eukaryotes, you initially get a message RNA that has introns that have to be removed. The uh, bacterial message RNA can carry more than one gene and it can have multiple ribosomes binding to it, making multiple copies of the gene all at once. So we're gonna talk a little bit about genetic regulation of protein synthesis. There's something called an operon that helps to regulate uh, protein synthesis in bacteria. Now there's, uh, operons can be repressible or inducible. So they can either be turned off or turned on. There are several antibiotic drugs and they target transcription and translation to stop protein synthesis. Operons are found only in bacteria and the archaea. They are a coordinated set of genes. They're regulated as a single unit. We already mentioned they can either be turned on or turned off. Categories determine how transcriptions are uh, affected by the environment surrounding the cell. 
So catabolic operons, remember catabolism is the breakdown of a molecule, encode genes that act on catabolism. Operon is either turned on, induced by the substrate for which the structural genes encode. Enzymes needed to metabolize a nutrient are only produced when the nutrient is present in the environment. So the gene's not turned on until it needs to metabolize that nutrient. Repressible operons, genes that recode for anabolic enzymes. So anabolism is when you, um, you synthesize a new molecule. Several genes in a series are turned off until by the product that's uh, synthesized by the enzyme. So when that gets low, they um, can be expressed. So one of the first studied operons was the lactose operon. Let's see what time it is. So um, the lac operons has several parts to it. It has a regulator. It's made up of genes that code for the repressor, a protein capable of repressing the operon. They have a promoter region, which is true of a lot of genes. They have a, a, where the RNA polymerase first binds to is called the promoter. They have an operator that acts like an on and off switch for transcription. And that in turn <clears throat> affects which genes, in this case, in the lac operon, three genes are either turned off or on. The repressor protein is allosteric, meaning it has another site, the binding site for the operator sequence on the DNA and lactose. In the absence of lactose, the repressor binds to the operator, blocking transcription and, and the structural genes. The regulator gene lies upstream of the operator and is transcribed constitutively, means it's always on. So this is what <clears throat> it would look like. You have three genes to be transcribed and the promoter where the RNA polymerase binds. In between that promoter and these three genes is an operator. A repressor protein can bind to the operator, preventing the RNA polymerase from transcribing these three genes. Now what happens is when lactose helps to induce the process, the the lactose, when it binds to this repressor protein, it will come off. The RNA polymerase can continue transcribing these proteins. The proteins can then break down the lactose. When the lactose is broken down, the repressor protein can now go back and bind to the operator, turning off the process. Repressible operons are usually in the on mode, will only be turned off when the nutrient is no longer required. Excess nutrients serves as a crow repressor to block the action of the operon. So this is a, um, through uh, regulation through excess nutrient. So here it's arginine that needs to be synthesized. And the arginine can change the shape of the repressor protein and then um, the different enzymes necessary are expressed and it can make the, uh, the arginine.
Okay, let's take a short, where are we? On slide 67, I think we have about 30 more, 20, 30 more. Let's take about a five minute break. We'll start back around six after eight. Whoops. Okay, I just went back. All right, so six after eight, we'll start and finish this mm -hmm. uh, chapter or most of it. We'll probably finish the rest of it next week.
Okay, <clears throat> so let's start. Um, um, talking about another process here. This occurs in bacteria. It's called phase variation. So in bacteria, they can turn on or off a whole series of genes. And what's unique about this, it changes their phenotype. It can be uh, phase variation can be passed to other generations of bacteria. It involves turning on genes mediated by regulatory proteins, similar to what is described with operons. The bacteria in response to a change in its environment can actually change its phenotype. Antibiotics that affect transcription and translation. There's antibiotics that inhibit protein synthesis, with ampamycins, actinomycin, and drugs that interfere with the ribosome, the tetracycline, erythromycin, streptomycin, chlorophenicol, aminoglycosides, they all interfere, blocking, eventually blocking protein synthesis also. What are the three important features of the LAC operon is that you have a, um, a repressible uh, protein that represses the operon. You have a promoter region where the RNA polymerase binds. The induction of the operon is caused by the removal of the repressible protein, which is caused by the uh, an excess of lactose uh, sugar inducible operon is turned on, repressible is turned off. True or false antibiotics that interrupt bacterial protein synthesis can affect eukaryotic cells. Well, the, the problem is, is the ribosomes of bacteria are a little different than ours. DNA recombination events, what a recombinant organism is, and the three forms of horizontal gene transfer. So this only occurs in bacteria. It's how they get genetic variation. So a recombination is any time a bacterium donates DNA to another one. The end result is a strain different from both the donor and recipient strain. Plasmids are extra chromosomal DNA that can move between cells. And a recombinant is an organism that contains and expresses genes that originate in another organism. So we'll see in um, the DNA technology, they take advantage of this to use it to introduce new genes. So horizontal gene transfer, any transfer of the DNA that results in organisms acquiring new genes that did not directly come from parent organisms. Plasmids are small circular pieces of DNA. They can replicate independently of the bacterial chromosome. This allows a transfer of DNA between cells. These are found in uh, most bacteria, some fungi. They contain at the most a few dozen genes. They are not necessary for survival, but they can pass on useful traits such as antibiotic resistance. There are three types of horizontal gene transfer in bacteria. The first one is conjugation. You have to have a plasmid called a fertility plasmid that has the genes that make a sex pelis that allows the two cells to join together and transfer the uh, genetic information across. Another process is called transformation. This is where fragmented DNA can be actually taken up by a common cell and it, uh, recombines with the chromosome and it can carry new genes. 
This is found to occur with uh, the bacteria that cause uh, pneumonococcus. They have a gene to make a capsule that makes them resistant to phagocytosis. Transduction actually occurs with uh, viruses that infect bacteria. They can pick up genes from the bacteria and uh, infect another bacteria and transfer the genes. Some toxins are transferred this way. Enzymes for sugar fermentation and drug resistance. So conjugation is a mode of genetic exchange, which a plasmid or other genetic materials transferred from a donor cell to recipient. They're directly connected by a conjugation pilus. It can occur and grow both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. Hold on a second. Sorry, the cat. The cat's being annoying. Okay, so you have a donor cell that carries the genes to make this pilus that bridges the two cells, and then the genetic information can be transferred. So in an F factor transfer, F referring to fertility plasmid, the entire plasmid is replicated and the copy of the plasmid is transferred to another cell. Another possibility is the fertility plasmid incorporates into the bacterial chromosome. It still has the genes to make the pilus, to connect the two cells, but then some of the chromosomal DNA gets transferred. So the new cell winds up with both uh, with chromosomal DNA from the uh, donor cell. Here, the cell only winds up with the plasmid from the donor cell. Now plasmids, you have resistance plasmids because they carry genes for resisting antibiotics or other drugs. These are commonly shared among bacteria through conjugation. They can actually result in multiple resistance to antibiotics. They can also carry genetic codes to be resistance to heavy metals or for synthesizing virulence factors. Transformation happens when a bacterial cell, uh, small fragments of DNA are released to the surrounding environment. And only if you have a competent cell, it takes up the fragmented DNA and re makes a recombinant chromosome carrying the new genes. Transformation was discovered by some experiments by Griffith in the 1920s. He was working with Streptococcus pneumonia. When they were grown in culture, the ones that had a capsule made a smooth culture and the ones that did not have the gene for the capsule made a rough culture. So the ones that had the genes to make a capsule were referred to as F, the colony was smooth. The ones that didn't have the capsule genes had a rough appearance. So what he did is he had the smooth bacteria inject, which made a capsule, which made them uh, resistant to phagocytosis. You inject it into a mouse and the mouse would die. If you had the bacteria that did not have the genes for the capsule, the R bacteria, injected those into the mouse, the mouse would survive because its immune system could rid them. What he found was if he took and he killed some of the 
uh, bacteria that made the capsule. So the bacteria were dead, but they released their DNA. And when their DNA was mixed with the ones that did not have a capsule, they could uh, make colonies of the capsule bacteria, which if was injected into the mouse, the mouse would die again. He called this a transforming factor. He didn't know about molecular genetics like we did today, but he knew something was carried by the bacteria that transformed the other bacteria from a non-virulent strain of bacteria to a virulent strain. Transduction is another process which bacteria can get new genes. It comes from special viruses called bacteriophages that affect infect bacteria. So these bacteriophages, they bind to the bacterial cell and inject their genetic material into the cell. So the new viruses are made and the cell is lysed and the new viruses are released. What can happen in this process is the virus itself can pick up a fragment of the bacterial DNA and the new viruses have viral DNA plus a little bit of the bacterial DNA that they can infect another bacteria and the bacteria can pick up this uh, new uh, genetic information. So there's two types of transduction. Specialized transduction is highly specific. It's when the bacteria incorporates the virus into its genome and replicates. And it replicates along with the bacteria. The prophage DNA separates from the chromosome carrying host genes with it. So it carries a specific part of the bacterial chromosome. So there's a bit of virus DNA replicating along with this cell and in specialized transduction it only carries the bacterial genes on either side of where the virus genes are inserted there's also another elements called transposable elements or jumping genes these were genes that can come off the chromosome and reassert in a different space, they can replicate. Barbara McClintock discovered this in 1951. Jumping genes are widespread among cells and viruses. Transposable elements, the, uh, they have uh, these uh, insertion elements that allows them to uh, insert into the uh, another site on the chromosome. You can have retro transposons, a type transposable element that can transcribe DNA into RNA, then back into DNA and insert in a new location. This is also something that viruses like the AIDS virus, they're called retroviruses. This is really unusual being able to transcribe uh, they can transcribe the DNA into RNA, then back into DNA. Transposable elements can scramble the genetic code. They can be beneficial or adverse, depending where they uh, insert into the chromosome and what kind of genes are relocated and the type of cell involved. These transposable elements can change colony morphology. In other words, the shape, they can change the pigmentation and antigenetic characteristics of the bacteria. 
replacement. It can, they can also replace damaged DNA and transfer drug resistance between bacteria. You can have what are called pathogenase islands. They have the ability to make their host pathogenic. They can contain multiple genes that are coordinated to create a new trait in the bacterium. These areas are flanked by sequences that look like transposable elements. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here. I'll just do this review. There are three ways bacteria horizontally share genes. These are transduction, translation, conjugation. Conjugation requires direct contact between bacteria and a plasmid that has a fertility gene. Transformation occurs randomly when a bacteria releases some of its uh, genetic material to the environment. Transduction occurs with uh, a virus. The difference between the F factor transfer and high frequency transfer and conjugation is in the F factor, the entire plasmid is transferred across in the high frequency recombinant some of the chromosomal DNA is transferred. A cell to be transformed must be competent in order to pick up some genetic material from the environment. Viruses called bacteriophages are involved in transduction. And the formal name for uh, jumping genes, as they're called, are transposons. So, the last section here is about mutations. So we'll start next week talking about mutations and then we'll talk about DNA technology. Okay, so I'm going to end our session here. Remember the, I'll double check, but the test is open till midnight tomorrow if you haven't taken it. And um, I think that's all. So uh, good night, everybody. Good luck. Good night, Professor. Okay. Good night, everybody. Hey, professor. Good night, Prof. Good night. Good night. Ooh, I'm going to double check the test. Okay. Make sure it's still open in the morning. All right. Okay. Good night.